Oh, so this is episode five of the Kyle Experience, and um, today we're talking about Gettier problems. So what is a Gettier problem? Uh, it kind of starts with the uh, knowledge of uh, justified true belief being knowledge. Uh, so the justified true belief account holds that knowledge is equivalent to a justified true belief. If all three conditions, justification, truth, and belief, are met of a given claim, then we have knowledge of that claim. In his 1963 uh, three-page paper titled, Is Justified Belief or Justified True Belief Knowledge, Gettier attempts to illustrate by means of two counterexamples that there are cases where individuals can have a justified true belief regarding a claim, but still fail to know it because the reasons for the belief while justified turn out to be false. Thus, Gettier claims to have shown that the justified true belief account is inadequate because it does not account for all the necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge. Uh, in the left corner here, we have uh, Mr. Gettier. And then uh, this quote I thought was kind of funny, but I really don't like it now that I've seen it. Uh, for example, when I talk to philosophers on my Zoom call or on my on Zoom, my screen background is an exact replica of my actual background just so I can trick them into having a justified true belief that is not actually knowledge. Um, it just, I, I thought that was funny just cause it's extra as hell, but- um, <laughs> And we're on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so do you uh, have any kind of questions with that? We're gonna kind of get into uh, justified true belief a little bit more in the next slide, if that's not uh, very clear to you. So no, no I'm, I'm interested in what you have next because like this just pretty much defines it, you know? Yeah. All right. So. Uh, here we have a kind of graphic that I like to that I thought was pretty interesting and useful for understanding justified true belief. So I'm going to start at the top left and just move my way from the top uh, from the top left to the top right and just kind of go down that way. So starting uh, knowledge is a proposition, uh, the content of your assertion or the underlying meaning of what you're saying. Uh, for this uh, kind of graphic, we're worrying about this is a cat. So uh, if you are, if the proposition you're saying is true, then that proposition corresponds to reality. So you could say this is a cat and it would be a cat. And that would lead you to an attitude of belief. Uh, this is a cat and I'm telling you what I believe to be true. Uh, but what, where it gets interesting is when you start adding justification and belief in. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with justification. Uh, so for justification, it's reasons and evidence for the truth or falsity of a proposition. So you could say, I've seen the cat, the vet says it's a cat, the DNA matches a cat. And if you believe that it's true, uh, and you have a, well, I'll start with justification, then belief, and then go over the kind of middle areas. That way I can kind of, kind of, I don't know, scale it. Uh, so belief is the state of mind in which a person thinks something to be the case with or without there being empirical evidence to prove that something is the case with factual certainty. For example, I would say, if I believe something, I believe that this is a cat. Uh, so if you have belief and you know it's true, then you have true belief, but you won't have a justification for it, which will leave you to true belief, which is I believe something and it does not match reality, but I have no justification for it. Oh, sorry. I believe something and it does match reality, but I have no justification for it. So it's pretty much a pretty good guess or it's poorly justified. Uh, that's uh, true belief is where we'll probably be hanging out most of the day today, just because of our uh, justified true belief. So you could have a true belief and have it actually be true, but it's poorly justified. So the question becomes, is that real knowledge or not? Uh, are you still uh, following along? Yep. All right. Uh, to finish with belief, uh, let's say you have a false belief. It's that saying that I believe something, but it doesn't match reality. And I also have no justification for it. And that's saying that it looks like a, it looks and acts like a lynx. So it's a lynx, but it's really a cat. You believe that it's a lynx because that's how it's acting, but your justifications for it are false because it doesn't match with reality. Right, uh, to kind of go over justification, if you have a true justification, uh, but you don't believe it, you're in denial. 
where it's true and there's justification, but you still won't believe it. So it could be a cat in front of you and you're going to say, no, it's not a cat for whatever reasons you want to say, uh, just because that's you're an attitude of belief. Um, if you have justification and you think it's false, then you have a lucky denial where it's false and there's justification for it, but one is lucky and not believing it. I say that's not a lynx, but like I have no way of really knowing that. Like I'm just saying that and it's luck. Right. Uh, to kind of go over stuff in the middle, if you have a true justified belief, you will have knowledge under this uh, understanding of knowledge where it's a cat, I believe it's a cat and I have solid justification for that it being a cat. A gettier case would be where you have, uh, you're kind of in the middle where like, it's true and false at the same time, but you still have a justification for it and you believe that it's true or, or false. So you still believe one way or another, but the justification is kind of uh, iffy to say the least. Uh, so a gettier case would be a situation where one can have a justified true belief, but no knowledge. There's a cat in this room. Although I mistook a lynx for a cat walking into that room, which just happened to have a cat that I didn't see. Um, we'll kind of go over some better examples of Gettier cases, but um, does that make sense to you at least? Oh, yeah, it does. I say basically what they're saying is like, you think there's a cat in the room uh, because you saw a lynx walk in, but unbeknownst to you, like you don't know this, there's actually a cat in the room. So you're, you think that the cat's in the room because you saw the lynx walk in, but really, uh, if you were to just go based off that belief, you'd be wrong because it's not a cat, it's a lynx. But there's a cat in the room that you don't know about. Gotcha. Okay. And then to kind of end our uh, time on this slide, there's false knowledge, which is knowledge that has since been disproven by new information or a change in the way something works. For example, black cats are good luck. Uh, something known... Uh, now just a superstition like they used to consider that to be a true fact that black cats are like bad luck or whatever you want to say and now that we have more information uh it's false knowledge because it's no longer uh no longer what it uh no longer what we believe it to be hey i still i still fully believe black cats are bad luck i think they're bad luck yeah i think they are too but uh that's just because i was uh what would be the word socialized to believe that I don't really have any uh, justification for that. I just believe it because that's uh, what everybody else believes. I see a black cat and I get nervous. I'm like, oh. So this, this might yeah. go bad today. <laughs> I'm going to go home. <laughs> Sit in the <laughs> room. Uh, but his original example, uh, Gettier's original example, is that uh, imagine that Smith and Jones apply for the same job. Smith has been told by the company president that Jones will win the job, and Smith observes that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So he infers that whoever will get the job has 10 coins in their pocket. But Smith, who actually gets the job, has 10 coins in his pocket. Nevertheless, neither of these facts was known by Smith. So he doesn't know that he's going to get the job. He believes that uh, Jones is going to get the job, and he believes that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So his argument is that the person who's going to get the job has 10 coins in their pocket. Uh, he doesn't know he has 10 coins in his pocket because who knows. And then uh, he ends up getting the job. So he his belief is uh, justified because the person who gets the job has 10 coins in their pocket and uh, gets the job. Uh, but Smith doesn't have any real knowledge because he, his belief turns out to be false because he believes that Jones is going to get it, but he does. So uh, where it becomes kind of a big issue is where Smith and whoever gets the job, uh, you can't like switch them in between because what Smith believes is not, uh, not correct. There's better examples that I have on this next slide. Uh, this one I use a lot because I kind of is the easiest for me to understand. So Roderick Chrislam's uh, Sheep in the Field. So imagine that someone X is standing outside a field looking at something that looks like a sheep, although in fact it is a dog disguised as a sheep. X believes there is a sheep in the field. And in fact, X is right because behind uh, all the stuff that he's looking at, 
in a hill in the middle of the field, there's a sheep. So he has a justified true belief that there's a sheep in the field, even though he's looking at a dog in a costume. So uh, the argument is he doesn't have any real knowledge of anything because his uh, belief is based off of a poor justification. Um, another way that this could be looked at is by Brian Scrims uh, in The Pyromaniac, in which a struck match lights, not for the reasons that we believe, like physics, but because of some unknown two radiation. So when I think of this, I think of like quantum physics, like how there, a car could just materialize in my room just because. Um, does that example make sense to you? Uh, the light, the, the match one? Yeah. Not really. Not really? Okay, so basically what they're saying is if we were to hit a matchbox, it's not lighting because of the stuff on the matchbox and the spark and all that. It's only lighting because of some unknown Q radiation that we haven't been able to measure yet. That's not true, though. Or is it? That's the thing. Is that how do we know? Yeah. Okay. Now I get it. All right. Uh, and then for Alvin Goodman's fake barn scenario, and we'll come back to this one uh, later because it actually uh, disproves a lot of, uh, like, counterexamples to Gettier's problems. So in his fake barn scenario, and he credits Carl Gannett with this example, uh, a man is driving in the countryside and sees what looks exactly like a barn. Accordingly, he thinks that he is seeing a barn. And in fact, that's what he is doing. But what he does not know is that the neighborhood generally consists of many fake barns designed to look exactly like real barns when viewed from the road. Uh, since if he had been looking at one of the fake ones, he would not be able to tell the difference. His knowledge that he was looking at a barn would seem to be very poorly founded because he could uh, just be looking at a fake one and not really know. Mm -hmm. All right. It's um, kind of like it's kind of like accidentally being right, but also being wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's like uh because really the conclusions that you're reaching are correct just by chance. Because yeah. like in the sheep example, he's looking at a dog, not a sheep, but there's a sheep in the field he can't see. So his knowledge is technically correct, but how much does he really know about what he's saying? Exactly. It's getting there completely coincidentally. Yeah. So Oh, but there's a couple responses to this. Okay, move this. So, uh, some early responses to get here conclude that the definition of knowledge could be easily adjusted so that knowledge was justified true belief that does not depend on false premises. This seems like a really easy way to kind of just throw all these problems away, but then more problems arise from that. Uh, the main one is how to know which facts are actually true or false when coming to a conclusion. Because uh, like we're saying in these Gettier cases, anything that I want to say could be true, could be false. And just based off of uh, like quantum mechanics, like I was saying with the uh, match one. So like, how do you know which uh, things that you believe are actually true and which things you believe are false? Another problem that comes up from just saying that you can't use any false premises is how far do you have to go to prove that all the premises that you're using are actually true. So like, and this has a potential for infinite regress. And that's kind of where this picture comes in, where it's like, you know, my explanation for, um, let's say that's a cat, would have to be like literally as long as this and probably even longer just to even say that. And that's not even saying anything about an argument, you know? Um, but our responses to Gettier's problems, whoops, typically fit into three categories. Trying to move this, it's not working, whatever. There you go. So the uh, three categories are, you can affirm the justified true belief account. Uh, this response affirms that justified true belief is knowledge, but rejects Gettier's cases. Typically, this means that they kind of say that the justification was not true justification. They had a poor justification for their things, and that's why it doesn't make sense. Uh, another kind of uh, category they have is uh, they add another condition to justify true belief. So this accepts that uh, Gettier's cases do kind of put a hole through justify true belief, but they attempt to add a fourth condition that will be like a quantifier to make sure that everything you're saying is true. 
Uh, then justification response, uh, replacement responses. Uh, this response also accepts that Gettier cases put holes in justified true belief. However, instead of invoking a third, I mean a fourth condition, it seeks to replace justification itself by some other third condition or completely remove it that will make the counterexamples obsolete and useless, therefore erasing Gettier's problems. Uh, we're going to start with the ones that affirm justified true belief. So uh, one response is that Gettier's problems hold no justified beliefs because it's impossible to justify anything that's not true. And the fact that a proposition turns out to be untrue is proof that it was not sufficiently justified in the first place. Under this interpretation, the justified true belief definition of knowledge survives. Uh, Gettier's cases involve propositions that were true, believed, but had very weak justification. And it shifts the problem to a definition of justification rather than knowledge. Another response is that justification and non-justification are, are not in binary opposition. So it's not like true and false. Instead, justification is a matter of degree with an idea of being more or less justified. I kind of like uh, the second response just because I feel like that's sometimes how things work in our world where it's like, oh, or great example would be COVID. Uh, we thought we were justified in doing X, Y, and Z. More information came out. We changed what we were doing. You know, uh, so were we justified in having those beliefs or not? You know, who knows? It's hard to say. I, I also like, I like both of these actually because the justified part, like for example, with the sheep, like you think it's a sheep because it's in a field and it looks like a sheep. So that's like, justification but if you got more justification if you even walked up to that sheep sheep and then yeah. saw it you'd be like oh that's not a sheep that's a dog what the hell's going on you know what i'm saying yeah absolutely so i i do like this i think justification is is what is the aspect that needs to be more refined in in these type of situations absolutely you know yeah, uh, a little star I have at the bottom here is that uh, epistemologists accept Gettier's conclusion. Uh, their responses to Gettier, therefore, consists of trying to find alternate analysis of knowledge. So, like, they're trying to find another way to define knowledge. Uh, but the problem with that is nobody agrees with that, you know. And justified true belief is pretty much our gold standard right now. And we're pretty much shooting holes through it. And we have nothing to replace it. Um, I think that this one, I think that affirming justified true belief is really the only way to kind of really deal with these problems because without it, you're like, and you'll see as we go through the rest of the slides that you, you have to have something be justified or like, how are you going to say that it's true? And, yeah. you know, weak justifications, we don't really know how strong they are and I feel like I'm getting into other slides here. So I'm gonna just go ahead and move on. Next, we'll move on to the perspectival account. So Robert Foglin gives a diagnosis that leads to a dialectical solution, dialogical solution to Gettier's problems. The problem always arises when the justification has nothing to do with what really makes the proposition true. Uh, there's always a mismatch between the information available to the claimer and the information available to the evaluator. Even if the evaluator is the same person, a Gettier problem arises when the justification given by a claimer cannot be accepted by the evaluator because it does not fit with their wider informational setting. The evaluator knows that a superficial inspection from someone who does not know the particular circumstances involved is not solid justification. So basically what he's saying uh, in the perspectival account is that your justifications are weak because uh, you don't have the information that an uh, evaluator is going to have. So you, you really are not just truly justified in doing that because your uh, opinion would change if you were given different information. Right. Uh, that attacks the justification again. Yeah. And that's pretty much what all these do is say that, uh, you know, your justification is weak. And it's pretty much saying like, well, here's why it's weak. And uh, somebody else will say, well, here's a different reason why it's weak. And I think my reason is better. Yeah. Uh, I like this one, and I thought that this picture here really kind of exemplified this one because 
you know, in hindsight, you know, everything's clear as hell. <laughs> you know, while you're while you're in the mix, it's really not easy to tell what's really going on. Oh yeah. So that's kind of, and I think that's what Socrates was kind of getting at too, where it's like, you know, I know nothing and everything that I do know is liable to change if somebody else were to be kind of examining what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're on to fourth condition responses. So this one is brought to, uh, brought to us by Alvin Goodman, Goldman, sorry. He says, a, su a subject's belief is justified only if the truth of a belief has caused the subject to have that belief in the appropriate way. And for a justified true belief to count as knowledge, the subject must also take, oh, sorry, must also be able to correctly reconstruct that causal chain. Goldman's analysis would roll out Gettier's cases because the beliefs are not caused by the truth of those beliefs, it's merely a coincidence. Uh, this theory is challenged by the difficulty of giving a principal explanation of how an appropriate causal relationship differs from an inappropriate one. So it kind of, all this does is really move the buck somewhere else, like pass it on to somebody else to fix because uh, they, they don't really have an answer. Um, without circular reasoning, without circular reasoning, saying that the appropriate, uh, Jesus Christ, I am just, out of this. All right. <laughs> About circular reasoning, saying that the appropriate sort of causal relationship is the knowledge producing one. So basically, this kind of turns into an infinite regress where, oh, how do you know that your reasons are going to be good? Well, they'll produce knowledge. Well, how do you know they'll produce knowledge? Because they're good. But how do you know that? You know? And yep. it kind of becomes circular. And uh, we went over infinite regress uh, our last video and why that's all bad because we're not really going to answer anything. We're just going to pass the buck more and more. Uh, without retreating to a position which, in which justified true belief is weakly defined as a consensus of learned opinion. Uh, and the reason why we don't want this is it's not as useful or as desirable as the unchanging definitions of scientific concepts such as momentum or gravity. So like, it's not really something that we could use every time. It's something we have to use, you know, if it fits. So let's say something comes up that doesn't fit, like a Gettier's case, that doesn't really help us at all. Uh, thus, adopting a causal response to Gettier's problem usually requires one to adopt, as Gladman, Goldman gladly does, some form of reliabilism about justification. Uh, I have reliabilism de defined down here. One has a justified belief that P, if and only if the belief is the result of a reliable process. So basically, they're saying that our processes, like his whole argument here is that you know, we got to pass this on to something different than our beliefs being justified. Our a priori, I want to say is the right word, like before things really get tested, because if we do, then we're liable to have a wrong, like, belief. Right. It's like just seeing that sheep in the field might not be good enough of a process to determine that it's a sheep. Yeah. But how far can that go? Because, like, in the cat scenario... Okay, the veterinarian says it's a cat. What if that veterinarian sucks? Yeah, right. Exactly. And that's the problem is that, you know, how do you, what, where, what's the level of justification that you have to take things to, to really be yeah. able to say something about anything? It kind of makes me wonder, like, I mean, nobody really does know anything, but also it's like, what, at, at some point, what gives you the right to speak on something? You know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. That's what because I think that's what I think is all about. What what the hell do we even know? You know? So I don't know. Yeah, no, and I think you're definitely on to something here. And that's what I was going through when I was making the slides. It's like, you know, how how well or like what point do I really know that what I'm saying is true? And how do I know that the person that told me this is wrong isn't wrong? And then how do I know that, you know something different could have happened that would have, you know, like in the future, all the things that we're saying now are just going to be disproved. You know, how do we know that? Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, another uh, fourth kind of uh, thing you would add to justify true belief is the defeasibility condition. 
So Keith Lehrer and Thomas Paxton in 1969 proposed another response by adding a diffusibility condition to the justified true belief analysis. Uh, excuse me. On their account, knowledge is undefeated justified true belief, which is to say that a justified true belief counts as knowledge if and only if it is also the case that there is no further truth that had the subject known it would have defeated the present justification for that belief. Uh, basically, yeah, this one needs foresight. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. need to tell if in the future someone else isn't going to be able to come up and say, well, you're wrong. And here's a piece of or here's a technology that shows that you're wrong. And here's what actually is happening. We don't we don't have that. We just don't have that. But, but, you, but yeah, but you can't determine it. Like you said, you need foresight. So you can't determine that right now. Yeah, exactly. So they're just the, feasi the feasibility is like it's it's kind of. It's just like, all right, we'll see in 30 years. <laughs> <Damn. It's> like, <laughs> all right. But all right, I guess you're right. I don't know. Like, yeah. that's the whole problem is like, how do you, even with the defeasibility principle, how do you know? You don't. So like, yeah. we really don't have any basis for knowledge at all. <laughs> Another, uh, <clears throat> Kind of fourth thing you can add to justify true belief is pragmatism. So this was developed by, uh, developed as a philosophical doctrine by uh, C.S. Pierce and William James in 19, oh, pretty much around 1910. In Pierce's view, uh, the truth is nominally defined as a science correspondence to its object and pragmatically defined as the ideal final opinion to which sufficient investigation would lead to sooner or later. Uh, I like these two definitions because I feel like those are probably the best definitions you can give for truth or knowledge. So like, if something's true, it should definitely correspond with what you're saying it's supposed to correspond with. And then uh, if it's pragmatically true, it should definitely be something that, you know, if I'm saying it now, then it should be said in a million years or else I'm not really saying the pragmatic truth. Like, it's just useful for me right now, not useful for everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pierce emphasized valuableism and considered the assertion that absolute certainty is a barrier to inquiry. Um, questionable, that last statement I find questionable, but I do understand valuableism, which is propositions concerning empirical knowledge can be accepted even though they cannot be proven with certainty. In short, no beliefs are certain. I think that's true because as we kind of continue to go through this, I do not find anything that is saying that you know, this, this making more sense, you know, I'm not finding anything that's saying that, oh, my beliefs are certain if I go through this thought system, you know, everything's kind of liable to change. Um, yeah, so what do you think of Pierce's views? I think, I don't know, I'm still trying to grasp, grasp uh, fallibilism a little bit. Uh, basically, don't read the top part. Just read uh, this part. Whoops. The part that starts at that, that no beliefs are certain. I really yeah. didn't add all this. So in terms of pragmatism, though, assertion of absolute certainty, a barrier to inquiry. What does that mean? What does the last part mean? I th I think what they're trying to say there is um, if you want to be absolutely certain about something, you can't really achieve that because you'd have to have foresight. So, uh, so just don't try. Yeah, that's pretty much what they're saying. Is like, and it kind of goes into it here in James's stuff. Uh, so James's epistemolo epistemological model of truth was that which works in a way of belief, and a belief was true if, in the long run, it worked for all of us and guided us exponentially through our semi-hospitable world. Pierce argued that metaphysics could be cleaned up by a pragmatic approach. From a pragmatic viewpoint of the kind often described to James, questioning if a belief is justified true belief is no more than an exercise in pedantry, uh, which is being unnecessarily precise or uh, accurate with your measurements. Uh, but being able to discern whether that belief led to fruitful outcomes is a useful end of enterprise. So that's uh, kind of what I have to say about like it being a barrier to inquiry. Like 
it's really if you really want to get to the bottom of the bottom like you're going to be doing fucking math problems for the rest of your life and right. you still won't get any answers probably but uh if it makes a difference like if what you're saying actually means anything i think that's useful because without like if not what's the point of doing anything if it's not useful i like the word pedantry it was unnecessary unnecessarily precise is that what you're yeah i like that because a lot of times in my life i get caught up in like black and white and then sometimes it's like there's gray you know like yeah. that happens all the time and you just it's, you know you're in between you're not this that this that yeah um, i understand you gotta accept it it makes it easier to just accept that some some things you don't know and you don't have to know and if you're meant to know you will eventually yeah because um yeah i forgot what i was gonna say but i definitely agree with 100 percent with what you're saying because really what are you gonna do like you can sit here and uh, like uh this picture here like well you can sit there and do that for the rest of your life just to argue a premise not even the end of the argument not even the conclusion just the premise like how do you what, what at what point do you stop <laughs> like and i think that's really kind of like i think that justified or sorry dead ears problems are like kind of being pedantry if that's the right way to use that word even but like i think that it's kind of necessary because we could sit here and think that oh if my belief is justified and it turns out to be true then i really have knowledge about something but like like we're seeing in these cases like do you really have knowledge of that sheep in the field? I think I was sitting here thinking about this. When you asked me about Pierce's view, what I was thinking about really was, wow, these guys are sitting here diving into this shit, like thinking about problems and the problems that the problems have. Like, and it's just like, wow, like I, would, I just, that seems pedant, pedant or pedant tree or whatever yeah as it is you know what i'm saying absolutely but it's also necessary for some people to do it you know yeah and it's like uh, even what they come up with isn't the truth like it's not going to be proven until when like it'll never be proven right it it's it will never be a universally accepted truth because there's so many problems with each one and like most of these have just like there's JT and B, justified true truth and belief. And then there's, they're either like, yes, but the justified part is off. Why is that off? Okay, now we have a degree of justification. All right, now we're going to add a specificity, another even aspect. You're just pushing off the thing. Yeah. And that is, the, the truth is, is that we don't really know. There's no way to know fully. Yeah, and I like how they kind of put that down here in uh, James's viewpoint, where it's like uh, being able to discern whether that belief led to a fruitful outcome is useful. But um, if you're just sitting there doing like a thousand justified true belief questions, like that's just being pedant. Like you're not really you're just being unnecessarily uh, accurate for no reason at all, really. Right. You're wasting your time. Yeah, pretty much. Um. So to kind of end what they're saying here, any unqualified assertion is likely to be at least a little wrong or if right, still right for not entirely the right reasons. Therefore, one represents the truth better by being Socratic, including recognition of one's ignorance and knowing one may be proved wrong. I think that uh, is a really good fourth thing to add to the justified true belief because, you know, oh, I, how do you know you don't really know yeah <laughs> yeah i think i think there's a lot of cases of being right but then it's just like all right like we don't really know why we're right but like it makes it we're right you know yeah we're breathing air we can't see it but it's there we know that you know what i'm saying and that's that's something where it's like you know how do we even know that we're breathing oxygen like it could be that you know, oxygen could just have something connected to it that we don't know about that makes our lungs pump or something, you know? Right. Everything's fucking in the air, bro. Um, 
So uh, the final one is uh, revisions to the justified true belief kind of uh, view of knowledge. Proponents of this believe that uh, they claim that conjoining a set of independent conditions was misguided from the outset. They argue that epistemological terms like justification, evidence, and certainty should be analyzed in terms of a primitive notion of knowledge rather than a primitive notion of knowledge being uh, analyzed by these terms. Knowledge is understand, oh, sorry, understood as factive, that is, as embodying a sort of epistemological tie between a truth and a belief. So that's kind of just like how, uh, what all these, the next kind of slides are gonna kind of base their claims off of. What does it mean a primitive notion of knowledge? So like, uh, basically what I think of that, I think of like a proposition, like, if like I, it's, yeah. you know what I mean? I think it's like, should be in it. So, so those, okay. So those three things should be analyzed in terms of, a, so Did like, you, I, yeah, sure. I, like the, I get what you're saying. Actually, I get what it's saying. I, I, I don't know how to like, explain. I don't know the correct terms for what, because I know what your question is like, what, what is that primitive notion of knowledge? Like, what does that mean? And yeah. I don't really, I don't have the correct terms or maybe the correct knowledge to really give you a good definition. But um, I also, <laughs> I don't have a justified true belief in that either. So I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know the answers. Uh, I'm just presenting the questions. Uh, <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. But um, truth tracking, comes from Frederick Dresky, uh, and it was developed, well, Frederick Dress developed an account of knowledge, which he called conclusive reasons. Uh, this was revived by Robert Nozick as what he called the subjunct subjunctive or truth tracking account. Nozick for formulation posits that proposition P is an instance of knowledge when P is true, S, which could be anybody in the world, believes that P is true, if P were true, then S would believe that P were true. And if P weren't true, S wouldn't believe that P were true. Wouldn't believe that uh, P were true. Uh, so Saul Krimke, uh, this guy here, uses a counterexample called the fake Barn County example, which describes a certain locality containing a number of fake barns or facades of barns. In the midst of these fake barns is one real barn, which is painted red. There is one piece of crucial information for this example. The fake barns cannot be painted red. So imagine that Jones is driving along the highway, looks up and happens to see the real barn and so forms the belief, I see a barn. Though Jones has gotten lucky, he could have just as easily been deceived and not have known it. Therefore, it doesn't fulfill premise four, where if P weren't true, he would believe that P weren't true. So, Basically, we're saying that uh, he does not have knowledge because he could have easily, just as easily looked at a different one and said the same thing. Hmm. Uh, an alternate example is if Jones looks up and forms a belief that I see a red barn, according to Nozick's view, this fulfills all four premises. Therefore, it is knowledge since Jones couldn't have been wrong since the fake barns can't be painted red. Uh, but this is troubling because... Uh, it seems that the first statement, I see a barn, can be inferred from, I see a red barn. Uh, but the first belief is not knowledge, and the second one is. So how do you make peace with that, where it's like, if I say, I see a red barn, I have to be able to see a barn. Like, there's no way you can say you don't. But if you say you see a barn, then you don't have any knowledge. Yeah, that's interesting. So the red, red is what defines what changes that because the other barns aren't painted red, yeah. the fake barns. But if you were to say that you have a red barn, then you had to, it's implied just by kind of, and maybe this is just a fault of our language. It's implied that if you see a red barn, you're seeing a barn. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like the color doesn't matter though. Yeah, and maybe that's, it does. And that's what a lot of people say is that like, you know, the color, shouldn't be that big of a deal to it. If I see a barn, I could be able to say, I see a red barn, a green barn, it doesn't matter what color it is. But uh, under, if you just say, I see a barn, you don't truly have any knowledge because you could be looking at a fake one. But if you say you see a red barn, then uh, you do. But 
that implies that you see a barn, which is not knowledge. So I guess I've never been like, hmm, I see some green grass. Yeah, right. You know, I don't know. But then even if you were to say that, you would still have to say that you see grass, like, because the grass could still be yellow or a right. different color. So I don't know. And I don't, I don't have the answers for this, but uh, like they're saying, um, it's a tie between a truth and the belief. And we can't judge it based on justification and evidence and uh, certainty because uh, we should be uh, not using those to define knowledge, but we should use knowledge to define those is what they're kind of saying. But, you know, with this, do we have a justified true belief that we see a barn? We can't because it could be looking at a fake one. We have knowledge that we see a red barn, but that implies that we see a barn. So how do you have knowledge and not knowledge at the same time? I don't know. Yep. Uh, so, and that's uh, kind of the end of that whole kind of line of thinking. So Saul kind of puts an end to it, at least in my eyes, because you don't like, how do you explain that? I, I can't. Maybe, you know, better minds, brighter minds at Harvard or somewhere, you know, extremely smart will be able to give a good answer. But um, for, you know, the average everyday Joe, <laughs> um, it's not really good. No. <laughs> Got my head in a circle. Oh, shoot. so we're almost done. Uh, so there are attempts to dissolve the problem. One might respond to Gettier by finding a way to avoid his conclusions in the first place. However, it can hardly be argued that knowledge is justified true belief if there are cases that are justified true belief without it being knowledge. Uh, in order to do so within the parameters of an exemplar, which is any kind of Gettier case we want to kind of bring up, uh, you can either say that Gettier cases are not really cases of justified true belief, or they really are cases of knowledge after all. Those are the two options. Or you can demonstrate a case in which it is possible to circumvent surrender to an exemplar, so to a Gettier's case, by eliminating any necessary, any necessary, sorry, a lot of big words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's possible to uh, kind of go around the example by eliminating any necessity for it to be considered that justified true belief apply in those areas that uh, Gettier renders it obscure without lessening the force of justified true belief to apply to those cases where it actually would be necessary to use them. So basically what they're saying is if you use it to say like, oh, it doesn't apply here. Well, you better make sure it doesn't apply any other case ever or else you're making justified true belief weaker than what it should be. Um, so basically those are the three options. You can either say, you know, it's not justified true belief, which is kind of what uh, the first kind of set of examples we went through kind of did. You could say they are knowledge after all, which uh, a lot of people do not do because, well, that doesn't really make too much sense. Or you could say, you could try to make justified true belief weaker, but then what's your real definition of knowledge then? Uh, but to kind of go through the slide a little bit more. So supporters of uh, argument one, which is uh, they're not really justified true belief, you have to argue that the creator of the exemplar goes wrong because they have the wrong notion of justification. Uh, such an argument depends on an externalist account where justification is understood in such a way that whether or not a belief is justified depends not only on the internal state of the believer, but also on how that internal state is related to the outside world. I think that's a really important part. And I really want to say that because, you know, I uh, a lot of people have beliefs that they feel are justified. Uh, for example, at my job, a lot of people feel they're justified in saying they're God or something like that. Uh, but if it doesn't really relate to the outside world, then uh, how how true is that belief? Um, I think that's important to add because, you know, it does matter like how it affects, you know, the outside world because what's like, if your knowledge is only knowledge to you, then is it really kind of like the pragmatics were saying, like it should be, let me let me get this right, because I really like the way they worded it. Um, a belief was true if in the long run it worked for all of us and guided us exponentially, expeditiously through our semi-hospitable world. So if it isn't true and works for all of us, then it's not really all that good. Um, 
Externalist accounts typically say the example's beliefs aren't justified because they are not properly aligned with the world, or that it is possible to show that it is invalid to assert that Smith had or that anybody had any uh, significant belief at all in terms of justified true belief or otherwise. So basically what they're saying is either your beliefs aren't justified or you're not even really stating a belief. You're just stating, what would that be? An opinion, maybe? Uh, sons of probably, parents, of course. Probably be an opinion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, these accounts uh, face the same burden as a causalist response to get here. They have to explain what sort of relationship between the world and the believer counts as satisfactory or just uh, or as a good justification for any relationship. So even with these externalist accounts, it kind of does pass the buck a little bit more back because you're just saying that, oh, well, you know, that belief isn't justified because it doesn't apply to the real world. Well, how does it apply to the real world? Well, that's a bit X, Y, Z. Well, you know, and it, it's kind of, it seems a little circular. Uh, so supporters of saying that Gettier's cases are cases of knowledge after all, are a big minority in analytic philosophy. Generally, people who are willing to accept that have uh, reasons for re why they want to accept that. Uh, so basically what they're saying is that more things, they have a good reason or like a vested interest in saying that more things count as knowledge than the intuitions that uh, justify true belief would uh, acknowledge. So basically like me saying that, oh, I really want you to go to the YMCA when I know that there's gonna be a shooting at the YMCA. Like that's not me saying like, oh, it'd be good for you to go. <laughs> Maybe that was a bad example. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what were you saying? Uh, Continue with that example. I think it was going to be a good example. But like uh, the reason why I would even want you to do that is because I like the reason why I'd want you to go to the Y in the first place was because I would want you to die. Not because I think it would be good for you, but because I want you to do something other than what it seems I'm doing. So it's kind of deceptive. Yeah. Uh, this last part, I didn't really need to add in, but chief wrong leads is Crispin Sartwell, who holds that all True belief, including Gettier's cases and lucky guess and lucky guesses, count as knowledge. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that statement because, you know, in the fucking goddamn, in the case of a uh, Gettier's case, you know, you do have knowledge that there's a cat in the room. You know, if you think that you know that cat is a lynx, and if you say that there's a cat in the room and you're right, then why, why don't you have knowledge? Even though the the belief was poorly justified, you still know that there's a cat in the room. I think. I think what I'm coming to terms with right now is that. If if. If there are Getty Getty A Getty Air. Problems, my bad for the hand in the face. Cool. But if there if those exist, then. It kind of feels like all of it is a is a getty air problem yeah that's that's what my belief is too like and that's kind of why i like doing that's why i want to do this video to kind of show somebody else that you know everything we're saying and everything we believe to be true is could easily be proven like disproven in the future yeah Very it could, yeah and it's interesting because like say like i said you can you can see the cat you can we could just be getting lucky everything could be a coincidence and i think it is honestly i think a lot of things are coincidences so if like if gettier problems are a thing then i think all of them might be gettier problems yeah every claim is every claim because how, who who's who determines whether you have enough justification yep. where does that line fall yeah and who gets to make that call too Oh, that guy's justified. He studied the brain for 20 years, 30, 40 years. And then boom, guy 10 years down the road proves them all wrong. Yeah, like lobotomies, Maybe. for example. Or yeah, or whatever it was where they put a pick up your nose and fuck your brain up. Yeah. Uh, like that was common, like gold practice. Like, but then, you know, however many years later, nobody does that. 
And I feel like sitting here talking, not not that we have an issue talking about them, but I'm saying like the people sitting here arguing this and like they're doing too much because all they're proving is that nothing is actually true knowledge. Yeah, even what they're saying. Yeah. And it's like, why are you, you know what I'm like, I don't get how can you make that claim knowing what you know, right? Yeah. I don't so know. that's why I, uh, and that's honestly why the first quote I chose was this one from Socrates, because like, how am I going to sit here and tell you that I know a damn thing when everything that I say could easily be disproven in 30 years or in five years or five minutes, you know, like, who? how do you know? You'd have to have foresight. That's exactly. None of these new You'd have to be at the end of the universe to know something for sure. The end of existence and be like, wow, that was true. And then boom, done. But we, but we don't, nobody can know that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I used to be a big arguer about things and facts and whatever. And now I'm just like, I just let people argue around me because I really don't know anything. Uh, and to be honest, one thing that I like that came from this uh, uh, kind of video was uh, the whole degree system where it's like, you know, my degrees or my belief is justified now. But, you know, in 10 years, maybe that justification goes down from 55 to 50 or from 55 to 43 or something like that. And, you know, right. Yeah, I, I like that because it kind of leaves us a way out of saying that, like, hey, I'm making this claim, uh, but it could be wrong. And I think that's uh, why the pragmatics are so such an interesting kind of piece to add to this, because they're saying like, hey, like automatically, whatever justified true belief you have, take it with a grain of salt. Believe the fact that you don't know shit like, you know, because yeah. really, how do you know? All you know is is it's. How do I want to say this? You only know what you know to a certain degree. Yeah, and that's uh when I think of that, I think like you only know what you've been shown and, yeah. you know, somebody could easily show somebody something different. Like, for example, when we were in second grade, they're not getting same, they're not showing the same videos that we were watching, you know? Right. And it's like, well, we're not getting the same knowledge that they're getting and who's going to correct us. How are we going to know unless we look? And even if we were to look, how do we know that the things that we're reading and that we're finding are even true? especially with Gettier's cases being around, like anything's liable to be fucking redid. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that these guys know about Gettier problems. Like they discuss them the whole time. They're actually just. <laughs> Doing a Gettier's problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's all circular, bro. Everything's a yeah. freaking circle. We can't figure out anything true. I'm trying to tell you, I was trying to tell you yesterday, our last video, bro. Like, yeah. even with causation, we don't know. We don't know shit. Like, we are all making everything up, and everything that we know, that we think we know, is liable to change in five years. Yes, and, like, I've, I've kind of, like, I've kind of taken even, like, direction of life, where it's like, all right, so where am I going? I don't know where I'm going, but I know why I'm going. But that why is also subject to change later you yeah. know what i'm saying so it's, and it's honestly facts are kind of an ego thing because or like a like facts that can become like opinions you know what i'm yeah. saying or like where people people's identities get wrapped up in these facts it's like you don't really know but the, the ego wants to attach to these things and believe them to be 100% true no matter what because it gives us an identity. It gives us something to rely on. Yeah, some stability. Some stability. You know what I'm saying? And so it's, it's interesting that all this can kind of be tied into that a little bit, you know? Yeah, and the part that just gets me the most is just that, you know, we don't – we just don't know. And even us sitting here talking about it, we're we're just kind of saying what we've been shown. You know, it could easily be that in five years they're going to find some new technology that's going to figure something else out that we just aren't, don't even have on our radar right now. Yeah.
And like aliens, bro. They're here. We don't know shit about them. I don't know. I couldn't tell you yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I don't know. Uh, but uh, my last slide here is on skepticism. Uh, this is brought up by Richard Kirkham. Uh, he proposes that it would be best to start with a definition of knowledge that's so strong that giving a counterexample to it is logically impossible. Uh, whether it can be weakened without becoming subject to a counterexample should then be checked. He concludes that there will always be a counterexample to any definition of knowledge in which the believer's evidence does not logically necessitate to believe. Uh, since in most cases, the, beliefs, the believer's evidence does not necessitate a belief, Kirkham embraces skepticism about knowledge. He notes that a belief can still be rational, even if it is not an item of knowledge. I don't really know how I feel about the skepticism camp, just because uh, I don't think that uh, a belief can be rational unless it's knowledgeable. Like, I could say, <laughs> like, under that camp, I feel like I could say, the grass is purple today. And I don't have any real knowledge about that, but it can still be rational because let's say I, I, my retinas are fucked up to the point where all I see is everything purple. So is that- It's rational? your conditioning. Yeah. So like what you're conditioned to, or like, for example, somebody, say somebody just gets, abs like just sees the worst in everybody, right? And then he's just like, man, everybody deserves to die because they're all fucking terrible people. Yeah. He now rationally, he's seen everybody do evil. He rationally feels like they deserve to die. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I can see that from a point where it's like, you know, you treat people like shit and then everybody treats you the same way. So then you kind of, you know, that that behavior that you put out. And that's kind of what that was a different video we were talking about where it's like what you put out will like come back to you and yeah. it's like a feedback loop. Uh yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like Kirkham does have a point here where it's like, it's best to like, but I, I just don't know if it's really ra like reasonable to say that you can have like knowledge about something, even if it's not uh, like you can't have a rational belief without it being knowledgeable. I don't think that's true. Well, that, that's my own personal thoughts. What, how do you know what now? How do you? then nobody has any rational thoughts because nobody knows shit. Right. And I think that's kind of where, I think that's where he, the conclusion that he came to, because it's like, well, we're like, if we can't figure out anything about knowledge, like we can't, we don't have foresight. So we're not going to be able to truly know if any belief we have is justified, then uh, it, we can't reach knowledge. Like then knowledge is unreachable to us. So then we still have to be able to act within a world like that. Yeah yeah i don't know it's it's like if you can't have a rational like be belief without it having knowledge backed you know what i'm saying like backed by knowledge then what what do we even because again i'm still on the on the thing that everything is a getty ears yeah problem. no and i think that's definitely the way that we should approach like this because anything could be just as easily as it couldn't be yeah but like we could wake up we could wake up tomorrow and just live in a different world and be like oh fuck that was a dream yeah or like even things that we believe now that we think we can't do like humans can't fly or humans can't do this like how do we really know yeah. we don't maybe we haven't access to that part of the brain maybe we're just not there yeah and it's like well how would we get there well, we won't know until the future. That's not a good answer for us right now. <laughs> like, that's not good for us right now. I feel, yeah, and I feel like there has to be some sort of degree of, like, present moment context. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't just base everything off foresight because everything's going to be wrong in the future. What you're learning in the future is that we were wrong in the past, and you're making more Gettier's cases where you're going to be wrong in the future again. Yeah, it's just a cycle. You see what I'm saying? 
And even even the even when you think the cycle's done, like all your conclusions are still up to like up in the air. So you could say that you know something, and then even that thing that you think you know could be changed in five years, or you know, it's it's just I don't know. And I feel like it's an infinite regress, and that this will never be really answered because we don't have foresight. It brings me back to like it just reminded me of this. It brings me back to a book I read in college. It was about knowledge is is ignorance because the more you learn about something 17 different questions now come up based on what you just learned or you know what i'm saying yeah way, I, I way i like to like think of that is as you approach your potential your potential grows so like yep. if you have potential to be a good doctor like once you start answering questions there then more questions come up there and that's your potential expanding in different directions depending yeah. on where you'd like to go yeah. um that's the last little slide i have for here let me go ahead and stop the screen share hopefully please i hope i was recording this awesome you were yeah thank god oh goodness <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what did you uh, what did you think overall the kind of presentation? Did you feel you learned anything kind of valuable or that you learned that you don't really know too much? I think I this put a lot of like the technical terms into what I've been feeling and like understanding gradually as life goes on. But um, overall, I, you know, I, I know these things. It was like I said, it put it put the more technical terms onto these things that I've been grasping with and and you know maybe battling in, in life and, and whatnot. But I really I think it's a good concept that to to know that you don't really know anything. You don't know where you're going. You don't, but you can know why. You know you can know why you believe these things. Uh, so but you don't know that you're right. Uh, there was a slide I had on my presentation I deleted that kind of went over the two different types of knowledge. So there's descriptive knowledge and uh, kind of procedure, procedural knowledge, which is like, you know, you can know what we've been dealing with this whole presentation is descriptive knowledge, which is like knowing that. So like I can know that the sky is blue today or that the sky is whatever you want to say. But uh, okay. procedural knowledge is more worried about like knowing how. So like knowing and procedural knowledge is more about like knowing how to do it correctly. So like everybody can shoot a three pointer, but not everybody can shoot like Steph Curry, you know? Right. So I, mean, I can, but I mean, yeah, I say not everybody though. <laughs> no, I get what you mean though. It's like, you know, procedural knowledge um, really kind of is where like what we kind of base our life on, like knowing how and knowing what, like not what, but knowing how and knowing where and like how to really kind of maneuver yourself in these positions but uh knowing that is just based off straight like facts and that's what we've been dealing with for the most part uh today i want to share something that you kind of just brought up i was i've been thinking about like what i do in life and like i do a lot of things like i work out i i don't know i take care of myself whatever whatever but I feel like lately I've kind of had a discovery that like I was doing those things to avoid things that I was going through. Yeah. But, but like whole time I thought like that was the way to do it. But now I feel like those things were just running away from whatever I needed to deal with. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I so that's one, that's one way I've like my procedural knowledge has changed. Yeah, like you think that, or for example, you think that like if you're feeling sad, a good way to handle it would be to go to the gym. But really what you should do is deal with whatever is making you sad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or like, yeah, like I think you should go to the gym when you start the day off good. Not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, not just when things are going bad. When things are going bad, hit the gym and then you'll feel a little bit better for a little bit while. And then you're stuck in that cycle of doing it over and over again. Until you... Uh, really figure out what's going on exactly you gotta you gotta I, you gotta sit with your with yourself it's interesting it's interesting that's something I'm, i've been going through you know 
Oh, yeah. So, well, I just wanted to share that. No, I'm glad you were you were sharing. I'm glad I kind of brought that up for you. And I hope that, you know, I, I'm not doing these videos to like necessarily help anyone, but if that's kind of what you get from it, I hope that, you know, it kind of stays with you and that you take these lessons and kind of take them into the next part of your life or, you know, help them, use them to help you kind of navigate life as it is right now. I know for me uh, doing this, and kind of just doing this presentation, I've kind of had to question a lot of things that I've done that I thought were correct, just because, you know, how do I really know that they're correct? What yeah. what basis do I have to say that, you know, I should discipline my kid like this, or my kid should be disciplined for X, Y, or Z, when really, you know, how do I know that that's the right thing? How do I know what I'm doing is correct? Yeah. And it's also, but it, there's, it's, it's dual-sided because you can, you can question everything too like and you can do too much questioning yeah and that's, <laughs> I, I think that's where the buddhist stuff kind of comes in where it's like you know you you have to, like it's necessary for us to attach to something because without that without knowing where you're at you can't go where you're gonna go yeah and it's like well you know it's hard to say that and then know that you know attaching to something is just gonna cause suffering because then well, even if you don't attach to something, that's even more suffering because then you're attaching to not attaching to something. Yep. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a void, dude. It's yeah. a void. Like, well, I, I'm sorry that for anybody watching that we weren't able to come to any solid conclusions, but I don't think that's possible anymore. So um, <laughs> anyway, well, if you made it to the end of this video, you probably like this type of content. So please go ahead and like and subscribe. Uh, anything you'd like to add before we end and shut this off, Riley? Nope, but uh, thank you for having me on. And it's always a pleasure. And I love talking about stuff like this. So. Always a pleasure, bro. Well, thank you for watching everybody at home. I hope everyone has a good day and good night. And uh, be blessed. Peace out.